Our next speaker is Pooja Rathod. She is uh, many things. She's a international, uh, national level uh, cl uh, rock climber. She's a boxer, but also she happens to be a marine biologist working with uh, Nature Conservation Foundation. But along with her marine work, she started a new initiative uh, uh, for us, in, especially in India. Some of these initiatives are there in other parts of the world, but especially for in India, on what we can do, to, can do to save these marine ecosystems. So, Pooja, over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> so, hey, thanks, Sumer, Sumer, for talking, giving that wonderful talk. I think he showed you all one side of the ocean, which is really beautiful, and I'm just going to show you the other side. So, uh, we are in the month of August, and uh, a lot of us here, we've come to Bangalore from different parts of the country, and even outside the country. And uh, you all must be wondering, uh, what is a good place to go at, it, at this time, you know? to see wildlife, where should I go, and what do I expect to see? And uh, I'd say, okay, it's August, and it's monsoon, it's the season for herbs. So uh, maybe you should go to the rainforest. And uh, if you were here in winters, I'd say, you guys should go see some migrant birds because they've come here to spend the win to escape the winters and come to India. But, uh, how many of you here eat seafood? I just want you all to raise your hands. OK, stay there. And uh, keep your hands raised. Uh, and so for lunch and dinner yesterday, uh, the hotel served fish. So how many of you all actually wondered about uh, what fish was it that you were eating, which part of the ocean it has come from, and how was it caught? OK, <clears throat> excellent. So that's what I'm here for. I'm going to tell you a little about fish and why we have this disconnect with the ocean. The same ocean, which is our biggest life-supporting system, because more than 50% of the oxygen that we breathe actually comes from the ocean. Most of the carbon dioxide emissions are absorbed by the ocean. The rains come from the ocean. And most importantly, more than 15 million people in our country depend on the ocean for a living. Sorry, I forgot to skip the slide. <clears throat> uh, so the fish that comes on our plate actually comes from the ocean, which is an ecosystem. And all these fish have an important role to play. Uh, they have lives. They have uh, seasons when they breed, seasons when they come together. And why does this matter? Now, why does uh, seasonality matter under the sea? Now, an ideal situation would be if uh, we followed seasons in the way we eat. Like, we follow seasonality when it comes to a lot of things we eat. We wait for summers to have mangoes, we wait for winters to have strawberries. But when it comes to seafood, we really haven't thought about it. So if, well, if we were to follow seasons, uh, say in summer, we'd uh, eat all those other fish, but spare these fish simply because they're breeding, they're carrying eggs, they're going to have babies, so we leave them aside to uh, restock and replenish their populations. Similarly, say in winter, we eat a different set of species, and in monsoon, we have a different set of species. <clears throat> but we don't follow seasonality in our country and uh, also in many other parts of the world. Uh, in India, we do have something called the monsoon fishing ban, which exists for two months in several states. And uh, the idea is that, OK, this is the time when the fish is breed, and so we should let them be. But uh, the truth is that not a lot of fish actually breed in the monsoon. There are some which breed in summers, some which breed in winters. So clearly, it's not enough. And so fisheries is a vast topic. It's dynamic. And uh, for today's talk, I'm only going to cover the patterns in which we fish in our country, and uh, how we reached this point where we've overfished our seas. So let's start with uh, how we fish. Now, if I were a fisherman, uh, I would think, OK, what's the fish that's going to give me the most money? And we know that it's the big fish. It's the sharks, it's the groupers, it's the tuna. So what we do is we start with the big fish. So say we start with sharks. And then, of course, we're going to get a lot of them initially. But at some point, uh, we'll stop getting them as much as before. And so we shift to another species, say groupers, and then another. And this way, uh, we've been fishing all our top predators. 
And it's a phenomenon in fisheries, which is called shifting targets. And these big fish are also the first ones to go. They're the most vulnerable to overfishing, simply because the bigger the fish, the longer its lifespan, uh, the longer it takes to reach sexual maturity, and the fewer are its offsprings. So that's a shark. Say it lives for about 40 to 50 years, and it actually only breeds when it reaches 25 years. So if they're caught much before that, you're stopping the population, that then you're not allowing it to restock. Whereas if you go lower down the food chain, so that's a mackerel, it lives for 20 years, but it reaches sexual maturity at two years, and these guys lay thousands of eggs. Similarly, with anchovies. And So that's what we've done, you know. So this is called uh, fishing down the food web. So we've started uh, with fishing all our big fish. And as we went depleting, as their stocks went down, we kept shifting down vertically in our food chain. So today we actually, most of the fishermen are actually making money of the fishes and other marine life in the lowest, uh, food, in the lowest trophic level, simply because all the others have, have gone down in their numbers. And uh, initially, all these fish in the lower trophic level had absolutely no economic value. These were simply tossed back if they were caught in the nets. But today, this is what the fishermen are making their living off. Now, but how did we reach this phase? You know, how did we even end up here? So, uh, <clears throat> prior to 1965, uh, we had a lot of fish, we were catching a lot of high-value fish, largely because uh, there were many small-scale fishermen uh, fishing using traditional fishing gear. However, to increase our fishing production by several folds, the government started providing, around the 1970s, the government started providing heavy subsidies, up to 80%, to introduce commercial fishing, so that we can increase our fish production. So, that is a trawler. And I'm just going to explain how it works. So the width of this trawler on an average is uh, about 40 feet. And uh, in India, luckily we have, not luckily, I would say, but if you compare, we have some industrial trawlers. The width of those nets is, they're as big as, they can accommodate four Boeing planes. The Boeing 747 planes, that's how wide they are. But in India, we have these. They are 40 feet wide, equally destructive. So what, how this functions is, so there are lead weights below the net, and these are simply dragged at the bottom of the ocean to catch prawns. Now, prawns live uh, in the benthos at the bottom. They're scavengers, so whenever the nets are dragged, they get uh, disturbed and get caught in the net. But along with prawns, you're catching an entire ecosystem. So you catch fish, you catch prawns, you catch sea stars, sand dollars, sharks, rays, name it, everything gets caught in this. It's as good as using a bulldozer in a rainforest to catch squirrels. You kill everything. So just to give an example, so that's exactly what it does. It even destroys the habitat. So this is what you get. So the fishermen haul the nets, um, and they sort the catch, and they keep the high-value stuff, so they'll keep the prawn, so that's the fisherman displaying his prawn catch. And what you see behind are all the other fish which were just caught in the process, and are simply going to be tossed back, dead or dying. And of course, a lot of endangered species, like uh, sharks and turtles, succumb to the nets. I think this picture speaks for itself. It's, uh, yeah, it's the discard. Now, sure, you know, this worked. Uh, the fishermen got a lot of fish, and uh, so 1981, so that's the time when the trawling started, and you can see there's this boom in the amount of fish we were catching, but uh, definitely it had to end somewhere. You know, there, soon the fishermen didn't get at, as much fish like before, and uh, this led to a decline in what they were catching. So, ideally, this, was, this should have been a time when 
We needed intervention. We knew our catches were falling, and we probably needed to put order to this. But <clears throat> something worse happened. This just invited yet another disaster. So all those fish initially, which were being tossed back to the sea, were simply being landed at these fish landing sites. And so Aaron Lobo, who's a marine conservationist from Goa, he was studying these trawl fisheries. And he found in these trash fish, I hate to call it trash fish, but that's what it's called, around 512 species of marine organisms in, in, this, by, in this bycatch. So now the bycatch was being landed. All sorts of fish, that's, those are juvenile rays, sharks, crabs, everything. Everything was being landed, dried, and it had found a market. So this, these fish, these low-income, low-value fish, initially, which had no money, now uh, were sold for poultry. So the chicken and uh, the pigs, and sadly, also aquacultured fish. You know, aquaculture, we say it is, it is a solution to overfishing. Clearly not, because uh, it's being fed to our uh, cultured fishes. And it's funny because, so the fish, the chicken that we eat is actually being fed with fish, wild caught fish today. Also, the aquacultured fish that we eat is being fed by wild caught fish. So I often wonder if there's a fish that ate a chicken who ate a fish. It's very likely that has happened. Uh, <clears throat> now, if I'd put a picture of, say, um, I'll come to that later, but so a lot of what we eat today, um, a lot of what has happened to the oceans is because of our appetite for seafood. We love our seafood, we want to eat more of our seafood, but uh, we've seldom cared to know more about the fish that we eat. We go to restaurants, we order chicken, we know what a chicken is, we order steak, we know what a steak is. But when we order tuna salad or tuna burger, do we realize what a magnificent animal it is that we're eating? These fish can crisscross oceans, they can swim from equator to the poles in just in less than a year. And we'd be horrified if elephants or royal Bengal tigers were on sale, but we shop and fish endangered we shop and eat endangered fish all the time. Why? And so if I'd put a picture of a dead tiger or a dead elephant, I'd feel really bad. And all of you would have felt bad. But I think I feel equally uh, horrible when I see something like this. That's a swordfish. And I have seen it in the waters. I've seen uh, what they do. And I'm, I'd, I'd just like to show you. So, um, yeah, so they are the hunters of the sea, just like the tigers are to the forest. And um, so there are two things we can do. You know, one is to wait and watch and point fingers saying, oh, it's the job of the fisheries department, we need some laws. Or you say, oh, why don't you talk to the fishermen? You know, they're the ones catching fish. Or you think about what you can do at your level. And I think it's about time we make responsible seafood choices every time uh, we eat seafood. And so to help you do that, um, we started Know Your Fish, which essentially is a calendar 
which helps you pick the right fish. So if you see those circles in green and red, for every fish, so that's Jan to December, so for every fish there are months uh, highlighted in red where it's likely that they are breeding, they're carrying eggs. So those are the months when we are supposed to avoid them, and green are the months when they're safe to eat. And we've come up with this calendar uh, considering a whole range of issues, uh, putting in a lot of criteria, like we look at in, in what months do they breed, how much bycatch uh, does it involve in catching them, and uh, how much of the fish goes in discard based on how it's caught and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> so we have a website called knowyourfish.org.in and where you can go and you can click on any month. And here we have, uh, so the calendar just gives you information for the nine most consumed seafood species. But here we have 25 species. And say for July, we have species to avoid and the ones in green are what you can eat. But also it's important to know that, so we put small squared, uh, small boxes within each fish and that essentially tells you that, okay, even if I'm saying that shark is in the preferred choice, just because it's not breeding, that doesn't mean you can eat it. If you see the square, the red square, that's, uh, that, it, it gets the color based on its population. So if they're more vulnerable to overfishing or their populations are in decline, then, you, uh, then you're not supposed, then you prefer not eating them. So go for the green ones. And uh, so we post a lot on social media. We post the, the recommendations for every month. And for the people who are not on social media, you all can always send us an SMS uh, writing this, and we can send you a text message with our recommendations. And it's been, so we launched in April this year. And it's amazing because people have been very receptive to it. And there are lots of restaurants who approached us who wanted the calendar in their menu cards. A lot of them are serving fish based on the season. And we really didn't expect this, you know, because again, it's a profit-based industry. And for them to adopt something like this, I think we were just amazed. And we've been interacting with students from um, the culinary industry, so all the upcoming chefs, trying to work with them. Um, so I've added this slide for a reason. So that's, so if you look at the second picture, uh, that's a video made by the News Minute channel. It was put up in May, but I chanced upon it last month when a friend shared it with me. And it had 91,000 views. It was, a, it was a video made by them on Know Your Fish. And similarly, one of our mackerel posts, which reached about 17,000 people. The reason why I put this here is, I get a lot of this question that, how, how will me making a choice make any difference to this entire industry and what a mess we've made. But this is the answer. I mean, if you look at the second post, 600 people shared it, but it reached 91,000 people because those people kept sharing and sharing and sharing. That's how it has moved from one news channel to 91,000 people. Similarly with that post, I think 45 people had shared it and it reached 17,000 people. I mean, that is the power of social media and that's what we want. That's what Know Your Fish is all about. It's about consumer awareness. So I'd like to end saying a few things. I think the next 10 years are going to be the most important for us to protect what is left of the ocean. 50 years ago, nobody would have imagined we could do anything to harm the ocean based on what we put into it or what we take out of it. Clearly, we were wrong because like Sumer also mentioned, 90% of our big fish are gone. Our tunas, our whales, our dolphins are way down in numbers. But there is good news. 10% of the big fish still remain. There are still some whales singing their tunes. There are turtles flapping away. And somewhere there are still some bluefin tuna. There is still a lot left worth fighting for. And I became a marine biologist simply because I love the ocean. I love everything that lives inside it. And I'm here today because I want to do my bit to protect it. And I just hope you all will join me. And I don't think it's too late. Thank you. OK, I'm, I just I really want to thank all the people who contributed their photographs. I don't think I could ever tell a story without their contribution. So thank you so much.